just following up on this uh, business of um, uh, interpreting and personal qualities and capabilities of the interpreters, uh, which, which I have been talking about uh, here, uh, we have uh, Kaiser, for example, in 1978, with reference to uh, conference interpreting, uh, emphasizes that there is an element of knowledge you need to have, which is uh, to master uh, both languages uh, uh, very well, and you have general knowledge and background knowledge about the topic that you are in, and also personal qualities including the ability to intuit meaning you have to be intuitive in your uh, getting the meaning as quickly as possible and adaptability, concentration, uh, memory skills, uh, and of course public speaking is just as important. And finally, pleasant voice. Well, pleasant voice is not as important really. Um, uh, this is not as uh, important as the other elements uh, that are uh, mentioned here with regards to your memory and of course it's we talk about short memory if you are doing uh, however consecutive um, then more uh, you rely on your memory more and you rely more on your note taking when you are writing note taking uh, 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 while while being interpreting there uh, as well in liaison interpreting uh, language skills are just as important cultural competence is very important technical uh, and interpreting uh, techniques, um, uh, as well as uh, memory uh, skills. And there, there is also uh, the element of professional uh, ethics. Uh, this is another uh, element of professional ethics, which you need to be uh, also aware of uh, and, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, pay attention to that. In sign language, however, there, are, uh, there is the interpersonal, cross-cultural uh, skills which you need to be uh, competent in, as well as uh, interpreting skills which are under language skills. Uh, that is for sign interpreters. Uh, now we have finished uh, as a, a part of this series of these two elements, which is content, course content and training, uh, which is the first video I have actually done, and also competence and personal qualities for, of the interpreters. Uh, and finally, wor working conditions, stress, and uh, health issues. Now, in this one here, working conditions, this is really very important because sometimes there are some industrial issues relating to the employment conditions, you know, uh, and here we are talking about level of conversation. Uh, we're talking also about treatment by the employers, and we're talking about excessive or amount of work, both in the sense of excessive workload and underemployment. And here, of course, uh, we are talking about, when we talk about the level of compensation, let's say, for example, that uh, for some reason uh, you, are, uh, you are booked for, um, to do an interpreting session and at the last minute they've cancelled. Usually you should not cancel. Um, there is a certain limit before you can cancel a job. Uh, otherwise, you have to pay for that job, even though it's not in, done, uh, uh, that's in consecutive uh, interpreting. Uh, also, I mean, this is compensation. Also, there's another type of compensation which is relating to um, uh, health issues. For example, let's say, for, for uh, God forbid, somebody uh, got infected because of interpreting uh, um, in hospital or, or, or hurt by, by, by the client. Um, um, uh, in a situation where you, they are threatened and uh, physically attacked, um, uh, you know, what kind of compensation, psychological uh, effect, uh, it affects the psychology of the interpreter who has nothing to do with it. And also there are some situations where the interpreters, like in uh, war zones, uh, war zones oh, they were killed. What about the compensation to their families? Um, uh, because they lost their loved ones uh, here, uh, the interpreter who has been, has, has been uh, in crossfire, for example. Uh, also, the treatment by the employers, uh, for example, how much uh, percentage the employer should take uh, of the pay, uh, 40%, 30%, and so on. And um, should it be from the uh, service provider uh, who is actually booking you, not the actual employer who has actually sent you to do the job? of interpreting. That is if you're doing freelance. And most of the interpreters do freelance interpreting. Uh, and that is why it is uh, quite essential that you have this to see what kind of treatment you're getting there. And also when you are actually being asked 
to interpret in the booth into both languages, like into, from Arabic to English, from English to Arabic. Um, this is uh, uh, re really unfair because you've got a switch in your head, like a, a light switch, where you can move from one language to another. You cannot do that in simultaneous, in simultaneous interpreting, in a conference interpreting. And um, employers need to be aware of that. And these are the part of the ethics of interpreting. You should not actually be doing into two languages when you are doing simultaneous interpreting for conferences. And that's because of the, uh, the operation of, uh, uh, you know, uh, language switching operation in your mind, in your head. Because sometimes you forget that you should be switching from language A to language B or language B to language A, uh, uh, L1 for, to L2 and L2 to L1, um, uh, back uh, and forth. That's really problematic because sometimes you get confused which language you should be outputting in um, uh, because of the fact that you're doing that. You, you, uh, that you're doing that. Now, of course, you can do that if it's just a question being asked to the um, client and he, they are answering or they are in the conference. Uh, that is fine to do uh, both, that both ways, but not in a conference, in a proper conference. In a press release or press um, uh, uh, you know, conference, it's fine because it's only questions and answers. That is fine. And also there's a very important element I've just remembered about conference interpreting is that the actual text itself is pre-set, pre-prepared by the speaker and therefore it is more challenging for the interpreter because it's more compact, there's more density of inf information, it's, uh, the, uh, you know, the information is very dense and also the, um, uh, uh, um, the actual text, the syntax is more, more, more complex because it's well prepared. Um, uh, speech um, uh, compared to ad lib or improvised speech where it is uh, ad libbed and in, in ad libbed you will have more uh, redundancy uh, uh, in the way people speak because it's not as compact as condensed so therefore it's more challenging uh, for interpreters when somebody is reading from a paper when they are uh, doing their uh, speech um, and that is more challenging because there's more pressure on uh, 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 the chunking, chunking meaning how many words you should be actually uh, breaking uh, your, um, uh, what you are receiving. So every like nine words you speak, every nine words. These are called units, meaningful units, where you are uh, uh, splitting the um, uh, strategy, piece uh, meal strategy, which is what's called salami uh, technique, where you are actually breaking the speech into uh, section or into chunks. It is noticed in one of these, uh, uh, by one of the scholars that um, uh, those who are uh, reading pre-prepared uh, speeches, they tend to read a lot of, uh, before they pause, before they pause, they read a lot of text before they pause, um, sometimes 23 words in one go. So it's, it's, it's a bit very, very challenging and more pressure on uh, time constraint uh, in terms of speed, um, uh, in terms of speaking uh, or speech and pausing because there are two pauses of course syntactic pause uh, which you need to be aware of uh, semantic pause as well but you you uh, it is noticeable as well uh, that when you are prepared in um, uh, in in the ad lib one in the improvised speech um, it is much easier uh, because it's less condensed and uh, some speakers they tend to be a little bit more, uh, a little bit kind or kinder than uh, than uh, 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 to the interpreter by slowing down a little bit when they are speaking because they are aware somebody else is actually listening to their ideas and trying to produce them. And this is yet another. Um, the amount of excessive uh, work. Uh, just going back to the same point that was made about uh, amount of work, both in the sense of excessive workload. Excessive workload, for example, in the booth, you are left for one hour interpreting, up to one hour, which is extremely very, very hard for the interpreter who's doing simultaneous to stay for a whole hour actually interpreting because you are actually producing or outputting the uh, ideas and the concepts of somebody else, of the speaker's uh, views, and um, this is and also the underemployment when they are actually um, employing just one interpreter to do both from Arabic to English into uh, and English into Arabic in simultaneous interpreting. 
I want to uh, point out something else which is relating to sometimes, you know, the press uh, office of the speaker or, or, or the organiza uh, organization or the organizers of the conference. They might give you the speeches beforehand. Now, that is really good to have, but of course, what do you do with these speeches? You don't go and translate them because there's no point. Uh, you don't have time to go and sit down and read them. I mean, some people might assume that you have go to go and translate the whole thing and then go into the booth and do it. No, you can't do that. Uh, what you do is, what you, what you learn from this is that you look at only the ideas. You just l understand the ideas. That's one thing. And also, um, if there is a term that you are not familiar with and you would like to see what's their equivalent in the other language, in the target language, that's what you do. That's what you prepare yourself to do. Now, uh, in terms of, um, you know, the interpreter's inv uh, working environment, for example, the, the physical environment, you need to be aware that, for example, in the booth, you have to have to be very quiet. Um, uh, uh, you cannot stand in the middle of nowhere with a lot of noise and do that. Also, you need to have headphones in order to hear what the speaker is saying from a distance. You need to see the speaker when you are interpreting so that you can actually follow up with them. Uh, also, you need to prepare yourself well for the task you know, this is very important. If you, you cannot just turn up straight away to a conference uh, all of a sudden without being given any, um, uh, you know, few days to prepare yourself, to read about the conference, to read uh, background information about the conference. Um, and also you need to, um, uh, uh, this is yet another thing about the assignment when you are actually interpreting. I'm just going to show you this, um, uh, the physical, so the physical environment of time and, and place is very, very important. Uh, uh, they give you more time to actually prepare yourself, and the place is very quiet. You have a booth. You are uh, nobody is disturbing you. Um, also, uh, you have to when the task-related factors are important preparation. You have to prepare yourself well. You read in English. You read in Arabic. All articles. You watch TV. You you read about the conference as much as possible if it's a conference. Um, uh, cognitive workload, of course. Um, how much, how much uh, ch chunking, how much you, uh, information you need to receive before you output, how, and the, uh, uh, you know, the variables of the input, uh, how, much, uh, how many words before you start speaking, because you need to really start speaking very quickly, but then you need to listen and understand what you're listening to before you do that. There are also, if you're doing uh, um, um, uh, interpreting interpersonal factors, especially if you're talking about, um, um, uh, um, uh, you know, relationship with uh, your team members. For example, your interpreter next uh, to you who's sitting in the booth. You need to have coordinating with them. Also, when you find that the speaker is very fast, you need to press the button and tell the speaker uh, to g help your friend who's listening and finding the speed of the speaker is too high. The ratio is very, very high. You need to um, ask the speaker to slow down. And uh, you just press the button and say slow. And also the client feedback. This is extremely important uh, to know what the clients, what the people, the audience think of the interpreter. Uh, what's there, you know, you can do a survey for the audience who are listening to that one. Um, uh, more um, with regards to working conditions, of course, for the uh, uh, conference interpreting, of course, you need to have um, the actual um, booth size needs to be comfortable and the quality of the uh, sound is good. And also you, you need to, um, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, check the, uh, the equipment that it's working. Now, that's what Jumplet uh, Pelt has said about, described the working environment of conference interpreting uh, interpreters under international standards, ISO 2603, which is first adopted in 1974 for what is called built-in uh, booths, and they are permanent. Sometimes they, you can move them around the booths, uh, sometimes they bring them for the conference, and sometimes you move them around there. So that is really uh, something that's very important. I'll move on very quickly to stress and health. And there is the AIIC uh, workload uh, study, which addresses physical, physiological, uh, physiological and psychological parameters in the professional, professional practice of uh, conference interpreting. Of course, what's AIIC? 
it's not uh, as if I care, uh, 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 abbreviation for as if I care. No, of course not. It is actually uh, the association, uh, the International um, uh, Interpreters uh, Conference uh, Association. Um, this is what it is. And of course, there is also the element, not physical and physiological and psychological. Now, physical, of course, that you are uh, to have... Um, uh, um, uh, physiological, that you are ab ab able to do the job in hand. Physical, you should have, um, you know, what you can really do in 20-minute uh, piece of interpreting up to half an hour maximum. Um, uh, physiologically, uh, you have to be uh, capable of doing that task and you need to be uh, not over-exhausted. Um, uh, psychological parameters, you know, the cognitive element there, and your uh, information processing. And there is the fatigue, which is a result, resulting from excessive long turn, taking turns in simultaneous interpreting up to 60 minutes. It's, it has a very detrimental effect on the performance, according to various, like Moser and Mercer uh, et al. Uh, in 1998 and Zier in 1997. So this is really very, very stressful and very, very um, uh, uh, very uh, tiring, exhausting to do it for 60 minutes in the booth. Of course, there are other occupational hazards for interpreters in the community, which, includes, uh, which include risk of infection in medical settings like in hospitals and threats to personal safety, as in the case of police settings uh, in the prison. For example, if you're interpreting for a young man who, with an officer, or in the legal cases, uh, and that you are actually being uh, uh, doing that. I have actually covered all these uh, various elements, which uh, for today are this. And here are a few shots of me in, in one of the booths uh, when I was interpreting, uh, which I would uh, like to share with you. Thank you.